Good morning. Welcome to worship on this Sunday, June 27th, the last Sunday in June. I can't believe it. We welcome you to worship, whether you are with us in this building or joining us online. We are glad you are with us this morning. I invite you to join me in praying our call to worship together. We enter this space humbly, ready to hear your message for us. In all the places where your love and justice are unheard, where the noise of sins robs people of life, to quietly, gently, persistently proclaim your gospel in word and action. I invite you to continue to be in prayer with me and join me in our opening prayer that we will pray in unison. Divine goodness, Holy One, may we take time to pause for this moment. May we bear up in this moment, and may you hold us for eternity. We offer our lives in service to your creation. We dedicate ourselves to increasing beauty in the world. We commit to compassion and action. Amen. Our opening hymn today is Morning Has Broken, and it's from the hymnal number 145. We come now to our time for children. Each week we've looked at different, we've been searching for different things that help us feel the warmth, see the beauty of God in our lives. And so today, our scripture that we'll hear shortly from the book of Isaiah comes to us at a time when the people were waiting for some good news. Who's ever waited for good news out there? Oh, I bet all of us at some point there's something that you were just so excited for you couldn't wait to hear it, and then you heard it, and it made you so excited. So some, the message that they got was that peace was coming, that there would be no more tears. So what do you do when you get good news? Who can tell me out there? What do you do when you hear good news? Yippee! Yippee! Dance. Who else? Happy dance. 
shout for joy. All of these are different things that we do when we get so excited, dance or shout for joy. I think you could do either of those. So if you just stand there and you say, yippee, is that very exciting? No. Now maybe you could make it a little bit louder if you kept your hands around your mouth and you said, yippee, gets a little bit louder. And I have the privilege of a microphone in front of me, so it's much louder than maybe it would be for you out there. There's another thing out there that's called a megaphone. And you, with your bulletins or a piece of paper lying around your house, can make your own. Now it's easier if you fold the corners down a little bit, just, as, just an advice from me. And if you make yourself a megaphone that'll look kind of like a cone, and you go, it's even louder. And so when we announce that good news is coming, it's like that megaphone. We're using that to project that message out into the world, that the good news is coming, because good news is coming for us just like it was for the people in the Bible a long time ago. So we have to have our eyes peeled, our ears peeled, and our mouths ready to yell, yippee, when we hear that good news. So be alert to that happening in your lives. And I invite you to pray with me. You're welcome to repeat after me as well. God of goodness, thank you for beauty. Thank you for good news. Help me help you to bring beauty to someone else and be a messenger of good news. Amen. Our scriptures this morning, as I said, one comes from Isaiah and the other is from Philippians. And our liturgist this morning is Dixie. And you just have to turn that on. Yippee, they say. <laughs> First reading is from Isaiah 52, 7 to 10. This is from the New Living Trans... They said it's not on. Is that better? Okay. The first reading is from Isaiah 52, 7 to 10, the New Living Translation. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of the messenger who brings good news. The good news of peace and salvation. The good news that the God of Israel reigns. The watchmen shout and sing with joy, for before their very eyes they see the Lord returning to Jerusalem. Let the ruins of Jerusalem break into joyful song. For the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has demonstrated his holy power before the eyes of all the nations. All the ends of the earth will see the victory of our God. The second reading is from Philippians 2, 1 to 5, also from the New Living Translation. Have the attitude of Christ. Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Any comfort in his love? Any fellowship together in the spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had.
Blessings this morning to the people of God. Today we close out our June worship series entitled Beauty Evermore, where we're experiencing and looking at the beauty that is within and around us everywhere you go. It's based on that song that I hope that you've had a chance to listen to at least once in the last few weeks. This worship service has given us an opportunity, an opportunity to explore what it means to choose courageously, to hope defiantly, to love outrageously, and today to walk light with humility. Our focus for today is to walk light with humility. Each of us has the ability and the opportunity to make a difference in our corners of the world and even beyond those corners. When we choose to walk humbly with God, when we choose to extend love and compassion to others, we're sharing that beauty. We're seeing that beauty. When we take time to quiet our minds, to quiet our hearts and to open ourselves up to be instruments of good. So we end this series with the reaffirmation of our call to intentional, contemplative action out in the world. Today and every day, we seek out ways to see and experience beauty in ourselves, in others, and throughout the world. Please pray with me. God of love and God of grace, you call us to be your light in the darkness, to be your voice in the wilderness, and to be your hope for the hopeless. We know, Lord, that the world is so varied and so beautiful. May we seek your wisdom wherever it may be found. May we be the, see the goodness of the Creator the companionship of the Christ, and the insight of the Spirit. And may they infuse us now and forever. Amen. Isaiah 52 opens with the prophet's call for the people to rise out of the ashes, to put their best selves forward. The Lord is about to act. The people's exile is real. And the prophet, in spite of all the evidence to the contrary, can and does proclaim the promise of freedom. So what were these proclamations? What were these good tidings, this good news that was shared from God? They're reminders of who God is for the people. Verse 7 reminds us that God reigns over all of the earth. And then verse 10 points out that through God we receive salvation. The first proclamation offers hope to those who have felt hopeless, to those who have felt as if they had no voice and no agency, for those who have lived under the thumb of a king that is not their own. The message that your God reigns is so very important to these people. This message reminds them that the kingship that really matters is different from what they've experienced on earth, what they experienced in their exile. With this proclamation, it's its, it's own sort of revelation. It's a promise that they will see and experience the holy hand of God. With this proclamation is also the promise that the people will see and experience the salvation of God. We often hear this story from Isaiah around Christmas time when we celebrate the birth of the one who's called the Prince of Peace. The people to whom Isaiah is writing are oppressed. Exiled by their captors, they have known great suffering. When Isaiah writes, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of the messenger who brings good news. It's not simply the feet that we're talking about. It's the whole body. It's the whole message. It's the whole picture that brings that peace. 
When you think about that phrase, it might also maybe come to mind something that we use now. You're a sight for sore eyes. That's what that goodness felt like. That happiness, that peace is that sight for sore eyes. The image of that messenger bringing good news is a welcome sight and is a cause for great joy. To be part of the restoration of love and peace and hope is our call. A reading from the Apostle Paul in his letter to the people of Philippi is one that calls for us to live our lives after the example of Christ. To live a life led by humility. To live a life in which we care and lift up one another. Throughout my life, I've had many people touch my life and the lives of others through their acts of humility, through their Christ-like behavior. This past week, I was reminded of a group of people who have been doing that for the Longmont community for just over 11 years. Back in 2010, and in the years leading up to it, the people and the pastor of Westview Presbyterian Church saw a need in their community. And they determined that they could work with Community Food Share to fulfill that need and created what is now known as the Round Pantry. Every month on the second and fourth Tuesday, except in December, when it's only the second one, but they get twice as much stuff, so it's okay. <laughs> the Round Pantry is open to any and all who are in need of food. And each guest is greeted with respect, with acceptance, with joy, and with love. Since the start of the pandemic, the numbers of families served each pantry week has grown by more than three and a half percent, or three and a half times. In February of 2020, the Round Pantry served just over 200 households each week, twice a month. And then by December of 2020, they were serving between 800 and 900 households each week. I first became aware of the Round Pantry back in its beginning through my mother-in-law, the Reverend Vicki Kinsel, who was the pastor at the time at Westview, and also through Nancy Hranick, who was one of the founding members, is still the facilitator, and was a former principal of mine when I was teaching. She always joked that she hired my mother-in-law at the church and me at the school. <laughs> These two women continued to lead the way in getting food into the hands of the most vulnerable throughout our community. They and countless other people of all ages and stages commit week after week, month after month, year after year to feeding the hungry in body, mind, and spirit. That's their motto. When my babies were really small, we were thankful for the supplemental food that we received from the Round Pantry. As feeding that many mouths took a whole bunch of food. At that time and several times since then, I've had the opportunity to volunteer in various capacities and each and every time I have leave inspired and grateful for this amazing resource and those who dreamed it into a reality. With the increased number of households being served comes an increased need for more volunteers. To, that, to this end, last week, our four young people and myself had the opportunity to volunteer in the sorting and the distribution of the food. It was a blessing to serve alongside seasoned longtime volunteers and newer volunteers as well. We're looking forward to the opportunity to volunteer again. And if you, any of you, have the time or the interest to volunteer as well, let me know and I'll hook you up with who you need to talk to because they are always in need of helpers. The Apostle Paul calls for the people of Philippi and in turn each of us to live our life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ and to have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. 
The founding members and countless volunteers of the Round Pantry are doing just that. When we live and do things with the mindset of Christ, we don't do them for accolades, but rather to share the joy and the love that we receive through Christ Jesus. And the Apostle Paul also calls for the people to come together, to do the good work we are called to do in unity together, and to do it with humility. He points out that believers are to be characterized not by selfish ambition, but by humility. Doing so requires one to hold up the interests of others above your own. This humility that Paul writes about stands opposite of the honor seeking that was prevalent at the time amongst the religious and political leaders. This honor seeking often led to prideful living, which was exactly the opposite of what the Apostle Paul was asking them to do. He was encouraging them and reminding them to live like Jesus, to live life humbly as Jesus did. And his, his appeal goes beyond just these, that humili humility. It's also a call for unity, for coming together amongst the people. In his mind, the two, humility and unity, go hand in hand. One is necessary for the other. True humility is measured not by low self-evaluation, but by authentic concern for others, by taking into consideration what is good for the greater good, what is good for the whole, not each part. Throughout this worship series, we have taken time to contemplate the theology of beauty and divine goodness We've taken time to make the connections between well-being of our souls and well-being of all of creation. My prayer for each of us is that we will continue to use these contem contemplative practices, continue to cultivate our life in caring and compassionate ways. I'd like to close with a quote from a theologian and a spiritual professor and author named Dr. Wendy Farley. She says, a contemplative life can empty us and ready us to become instruments of good for all of the beauty of the earth. So let us be open to being filled up by the goodness of God so that we can share that goodness, share that compassion with others. Amen. I invite you now to a time of silent prayer and meditation, and we'll close that time with the Lord's Prayer.
Please pray with me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn today is different than what's in your bulletin, but the right song will be on the screen. If you would like to hear the song that's in your bulletin, it is posted on our Facebook page, but we couldn't put it into part of our streaming. But it is there, and it is beautiful, so I would recommend finding it on the Facebook page after worship. But this song is Be Thou My Vision, and it's featuring our choir, and it's from the hymnal 451. We thank you for worshiping with us today and thank you for the many ways that you support the mission and ministry of this church through your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness. It's because of all of you that we can do ministry here and outside of the walls of this church as well. So we thank you. And we go from this place filled with the blessings and the joy and the love of God so that we may share that with others, so that we may be compassionate to our neighbors, so that we may love those who are feeling a little alone. May we go filled by God's Spirit out into the world. Amen. And a reminder, I'll let you switch to the next slide. I'll talk over this next one. A reminder, next week is the 4th of July. Ah! And so we are doing things a little differently. There is a parade, a motorcade parade that goes through Niawat that we'll be participating in, but it happens at the same time our worship services. So we'll have a brief 9 o'clock communion in the parking lot for those who would like to come to that. Then we'll decorate and get ready to go to the motorcade. And I will, there will be a pre-recorded service that will go live on our Facebook page at 1020. So if you're not in the parade or you want to watch church on Monday morning, it'll be there. So we hope that you'll join us for either or both of those things next Sunday.
Thank you, Pat. I always love listening to that. <laughs> we come to a time to share those.